Forward. On April 30th, 1995, I took an El Al flight from Tel Aviv to Munich. From the terminal, I took the S-Bahn to Tutzing, and from there I was driven to Seesacht, a small Bavarian resort. This was not an easy journey to take, and I took it after some weeks of deliberation. I was going back to Germany, 50 years later. It was in Seesacht on this very day, 50 years ago, that the American army had liberated me, along with my brother and my mother and thousands of other skeletal prisoners. Some leading citizens of Seesacht had decided to commemorate the event. They formed a committee and dispatched letters of invitation to possible survivors all over the world. One such letter reached me in my New York home, and here I was, making a detour on a Tel Aviv to New York flight to Seesoft. The former mayor's son, then a nine-year-old boy, remembered how the victorious allies had led his father and his family and all other members of the local elite to the Seesoft train station, where they witnessed a most horrifying picture of human suffering. The sight of thousands of disfigured corpses and maimed dying skeletons left an indelible mark on his awareness. Now he's a doctor in Seesaw, and when his patients, members of the post-war generation, refused to believe his account of what he saw, he decided to bring back survivors of that ghastly liberation as living proof that the unbelievable did happen. The sky was overcast, and a light drizzle veiled my view as my host, Dr. Peter Westeb, one of the local organizers of the commemoration, drove me through the streets of Seesopt to the dedication ceremony. Eighteen survivors had arrived for the ceremony from all over the world. Some were from the United States, some were from South America, some from Israel, and one from Greece. The townspeople were there, about 300, mostly young. The present mayor of the town officiated at the dedication of a monument to those who had died and those who had survived to be liberated here, over 2,500 according to records. Young children from the local school planted trees, danced and sang, and the pastor of the local church blessed the monument. The local audience was visibly moved. We, the 18 survivors who had returned to Seesoft, men and women in their 60s and 70s, briefly reminisced about that liberation day 15, 50 years ago, and as we looked into each other's eyes, we saw that the years had not faded the pain of memories. The pain was intact, and so was the sense of overwhelming burden. A celebration followed the dedication ceremony. Several hundred guests filled the local beer hall, where tables were set up for a festive meal and musical entertainment by the local band. Quietly, I slipped out of the hall and slowly made my way to the train station. Late Sunday afternoon stillness enveloped the small town. I walked along the tracks to the colorless, deserted, memorable platform. No trains, no passengers anywhere, total emptiness only an incessant light drizzle. But for me, the platform was full. It was brimming with a disarray of sights, hundreds upon hundreds, a bleeding carpet of dead and dying. I saw Greco, the 15-year-old Greek boy, with enormous feverish eyes begging for water. I saw Lily, the 16-year-old brunette, with her leg blown off, sitting in a pool of blood. I heard Martha, blinded in both eyes, calling to her mother, and Beth, and Irene, ageless faces, skeletal limbs, filled the gray, translucent mist. There are no more trains today. I turned around, startled. The woman with the unmistakably Bavarian accent had a pleasant, nondescript face. There are no more trains today from this station. Thank you. I'm not waiting for a train. She waited, wondering. Then, with a hint of suspicion lingering in her manner, she reluctantly walked on. But the moment was gone. The half-century-old visions were no longer retrievable onto the screen of my present reality. A cold, opaque haze enveloped the tracks. The platform and the grim two-story sta two station house were empty. I walked back to the beer hall where the celebration was winding down. "'What message do you have for us?' one of the committee members asked me. "'What lessons?' I pondered the question.' 
I was 14 when the war ended and believed that the evil of the Holocaust was defeated along with the forces that brought it about. Six years later, a new life began for me in the new world, a new life free of threat, a new world full of hope. In America, I, drew, I grew from traumatized teen to grandmotherhood. And as the world grew more and more advanced technologically, it seemed to grow more and more tolerant of terror and human suffering. My fears have returned. And yet my hope, my dream, of a world free of human cruelty and violence has not vanished. My hope is that learning about past futures, evil, will help us to avoid them in the future. My hope is that learning what horrors can result from prejudice and intolerance, we can cultivate a commitment to fight prejudice and intolerance. It is for this reason that I wrote my recollections of the horror. Only one who was there can truly tell the tale. And I was there. For you, the third generation, the Holocaust has slipped into the realm of history or legend, or into the realm of sensational objects on the silver screen. Reading my personal account, I believe you will feel, you will know, that the Holocaust was neither a legend nor Hollywood fiction, but a lesson for the future, a lesson to help future generations prevent the causes of the 20th century catastrophe from being transmitted into the 21st. My stories are of gas chambers, shootings, electrified fences, torture, scorching sun, mental abuse, and constant threat of death. But they are also stories of faith, hope, triumph, and love. They are stories of perseverance, loyalty, courage in the face of overwhelming odds, and of never giving up. My story